Okay, so yeah, um, I've been based here also for 20 years in Germany. Um, when I first came to Germany, I was working in foreign policy, working with NATO, OECE, working on projects on environment and security and peace and conflict research almost 20 years ago. Prior to that, I also worked for the U.S. government as a security expert. So those were my foundations of how I got started in this field. Um, then I transitioned to opening a, a school of my own, so teaching communications, um, language, and that's where I be learned to become an educator and a trainer. And as I said, now I'm working on my PhD. So that's kind of my, my story. I'm looking forward to hearing all your stories. And I think it's important to understand where we are from and who we are and where we want to go. What is our vision? Um, and having these conversations with, with people is important. We're, our stories and who we are fundamentally is what is important. So I want to go on to ask you um, what you think culture means. Okay, so we hear a lot cultural diversity, cultural understanding, cross-cultural training. Now what, is, what, what does that all mean? Um, you know, there's all these buzzwords, cultural coaches, cultural mediation. Um, so any of you, can you all, you know, I like this to be interactive. I'm not going to read you my paper. You can read it for yourselves. Um, anybody, uh, what, when culture comes to mind, what do you think? On this side, the lady with the beautiful purple shirt. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Our values, our traditions, history, um, maybe arts, mm -hmm. um, religious belonging, mm -hmm. not only belief but spiritual values, mm -hmm. um, and of course the, the relationship with others. Mm -hmm. That's how we kind of all together makes the culture we live in or we present. So it could be tradition, food, whatever we are, whatever we live in. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I, I think that's, that's the culture for me. Okay. Any, any from, from this side of the audience? Anybody want to share? Yes, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I think culture is um, all our thoughts and uh, all our behavior. Behaviors. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, Okay, go ahead, yes, please. Um, for me, culture is something that is both smaller and bigger than the nation state. Mm -hmm. It's not the nation, it's not the state, it's not sorry, the group. It can be three people, mm -hmm. it can be two billion people that are fractured all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it's about a sense of normality and community. In terms of like, we, whoever belongs to that culture, we have a set of something we think is normal when we behave a certain way when we say something that is normal mm -hmm. that's regular and we identify our belonging to the culture by a set or by a feeling of this is my community mm -hmm. okay great so you guys are the real experts here um, in my paper I really go into a theoretical argument how culture has been defined over the last hundred years so uh, there are many definitions uh, there are many components but here as you see our environment, our behaviors, um, our values, attitudes, our beliefs, these are all part of what makes up a culture, plus many of those things that you've said. Um, so of course, when we look at the map, uh, you know, what impressions do you get? If you look at this map of the world, you see our nation, our nation states, right? These are what we define, if we look at our flag, we identify that our culture. So I, I want to challenge you today to think um, what things impact on how you view other cultures. Okay. Do you see the world in this way, according to political boundaries or according to our flags? Um, okay. This is a rhetorical question, but you can answer. Yeah, actually, according to nation states, there are many nations and cultures Invisible in this. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
that leads me to, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, today, really my presentation is just to kind of get you thinking and you know, setting the scene for what's to come. Um, okay, go ahead. Well, you're talking about conflict resolution. Right? Yes. And, and you're presenting, you know, culture maybe as an important actor, you know, regarding that maybe it can be the reason for a conflict, you know, people mm -hmm. are fighting because they have different cultures and so on. Mm -hmm. You say, for example, one, you know, culture or nation is one of the you know, is an older, you know, um, definition, you know. Uh, but th that's the thing, you know, this is the fever that human being has, because definition is a Latin word that it means it's just to set a limit to something. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, when you are defining something, you know, it's because you need to be pragmatic and say, okay, this is that, because you are setting out a limit. Or I want to say that I don't believe that culture is the reason of every conflict. People are not You know, I am not an alcoholic, but it's very important. I know people that they were alcoholics. It's very important, you know, for alcoholics that the first step to move out is, you know, to be, you know, be aware that you have a problem. Mm -hmm. So this is the same thing. You want to fix the problem of conflict resolution. You know, you have to be aware that the problem is not culture. Okay. The problem is, is the, the use of culture by the money. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, let's. Could we, I'm gonna have to get going through the conversation, uh, otherwise we're not gonna make it to the end. I think I have a half an hour. Um, so uh, when, when one is studying coaching or communication and you're dealing with a client or an individual, um, I wanted to kind of show this iceberg model. Maybe you're all familiar with Freud and uh, from a psychology standpoint when you're really analyzing what is really going on. Uh, um, this is a really great graphic. Um, I think we spoke about that, the visible, what we see on the visible surface, and the invisible things that are happening. And often when we're in policy or we're dealing you know, with deep-seated conflicts, um, it's very necessary that we go under the ocean, right, at the base of the iceberg, which is huge. Uh, that's where the problems are. And I, 
wanted to show you this graphic so you start thinking when, when you're really hearing about a conflict, um, you're probably hearing about the surface of it. Um, and it's important that we start peeling away and going deeper down into the conflicts to really understand where the problems lie. Often it's historical past, our upbringings, many of our values have been centered from how we grew up. Um, and we really, to understand a person, we really need to understand these things. I'm sure you all have partners, spouses. You know, when you meet them, it's all up here, right? And then over time, you start getting below the surface, and you start seeing things that are not very pleasant to deal with, right? These are those hidden shadows. These are those things that pop out. And it's really important when you're working with communities, people, that you start asking the right questions, start looking below the surface on really what's going on. Um, um, I, through my coaching uh, training, learned about many different models. And I came across this individual, Friedemann Schultz von Thun. And there's always a receiver. When you send a message, there's a receiver. And how we code it and what we hear is part of communication. And I explain this a little bit more in the paper. Um, but I thought it was interesting, how do we hear a message? Are we listening on the factual level? Are we listening on a relationship level? Are we listening that we heard a command behind that? And there's a famous uh, model here called the four ears model. And it's a man and his wife driving a car pulls up to a red light and the husband's sitting beside his wife and says, the light is green. I heard the light is green. Okay, appeal level, the light is green. The wife thinks, oh, I've got to get a move on. Excuse me, the husband's saying, get a move on. And the wife means, oh, I need to start pulling away. Relationship level, the light is green. The husband says to wife, she's interpreting that you need my help, I'm your husband, I have to tell you how to drive. And she's thinking, oh, he thinks I'm a bad driver because he's telling me I have to drive. <coughs> Self-relevation, this is what she's believing. The husband, oh, he's in a hurry, he wants to get going. There's different, this is the same message, the light is green. That's all that was said, but this is how you might interpret it. Be so the point here is any message that you're receiving how are you decoding it? How are you hearing, yeah. interpreting, and making decisions? So when we're in negotiations and policy, what you might be hearing and what might be being said, and how you're interpreting that might lead to a false reaction. Okay, so we all have to be very wary of these things. Same thing, I'm sure you all know about this, communication skills. What role does nonverbal communication play in negotiation. You know, there's handbooks written on how to deal with different cultures, certain protocols, certain nonverbal behaviors, eye contact, handshake, exchanging business cards. There is a lot written out there about this. But start when you're dealing with people, start reading them. How are they, you know, how is their eye contact? Are they nervous? What is happening? And, and start building relationships to those people by understanding what's going on with them. So in coaching, one learns to really read the person. You're asking the right questions. You're getting below the surface, what's going on. So finally, you're getting to the facts and you're getting to the core of what the problem is. So in my paper, I also talk about cultural layering, cultural stereotyping, uh, what are our biases, and I, I started looking at maps uh, just for fun and you know uh, came across the classic map right this is the map of the world our countries and then I came across this map which is a children's map and how do you all feel when you look at this map happy, happy? Mm -hmm. maybe optimistic I mean, it, it, it's hard to see here. It's, it's, 
I'm sorry? Confused? Okay. No, it sees, it, it sees a certain playful diversity without placing any strict border lines mm -hmm. on, at, at, on the right side. Mm -hmm. So, differences, yes, but it can include. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Perceptions. Perceptions, exactly. Okay. And I love this because children, this is how they see the world, and you talk to them, and they're so culturally open and diverse and happy and that doesn't bother them. And then over time, we, we create these maps of the world, which are very biased. Uh, how they're drawn, is it really reflected the size of the country? Um, who's creating the maps? What books are they in? So this is all part of our cultural upbringing. Uh, and so I just put that here just to kind of get you guys thinking about it. The next map, um, it was a big study in the US uh, looking at cultural mapping around the world, how certain societies view others. Uh, it's a little bit controversial, uh, this map here. Uh, and any Americans in the room, I apologize. Uh, it's not, this is just uh, to show the danger of stereotyping, okay? Um, there was a study, The World According to Americans, it was a designer who came up with a, call, a project called Mapping Stereotypes. And this was a map uh, asking in a survey of how Americans see the rest of the world. Um, May I ask what is the reason in Brazil? I cannot Brazil? Yeah, I'm sorry, this is not such a great. Um, um, I have to look on my own. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I think it says uh, something like rainforest. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Uh, rainforest. Or football. Um, <laughs> so I, I've done this before in a group uh, and had different maps of India, <coughs> Africa, America, Canada, and it was interesting to, to ask everybody what their original, how they view that area of the world. And I'm sure you've come across this. If you, you know, I said I'm from Panama, and everybody just says, where's that? Or what do you do there? And of course, as our world gets more international and diverse, people are more aware of the globe and what countries are out there. Um, but of course, if you're negotiating and doing business with people from other cultures, you need to establish rapport with each other. You need to break down these cultural barriers first, misunderstandings. Um, uh, okay. Uh, also in my paper, I start looking at what different cultural tools are available for you all as practitioners. Um, there are many, many different um, profiling tools that you all can use. And there was an uh, individual called Richard Lewis, and he has studied different cultures and typologies um, and looks at how cultures are linear, multi-active, or reactive. It's just a, a graphic. I, again, I go in the paper explaining these a little bit more. Then there's another um, culture expert called Aaron Meyer who wrote um, uh, how to get things done across cultures, and her book really focuses on col corporate culture uh, and doing business worldwide. And she came up with a cultural profile. I have some printouts here. It's also in my paper. A link where you can go to her website, and you can fill it out. It's like a 25-page profile, and it shows how you, according to your culture, view how people react. And it's quite interesting, because uh, then you could look at your culture and compare it to, let's say, you're doing business with Japanese, how you rate it against their culture. And then you can already see, when you're working interculturally, have your clients do this, it, because it's like a real awareness to them that they realize, oh, that's how I communicate. Oh, I never really realized that. So this is a tool that could be helpful for you all. Um, I'm also, I see the next speaker is talking about mediation uh, as an intercultural mediation expert. That's where I'm going to study in the future. I'm are specializing in narrative and transformative mediation and the power of that. But I just wanted to, to pull, pull up here, um, there are many tools out there, uh, negotiation, facilitation, uh, learning to be a powerful moderator. So you all have to kind of figure out what niche you, know, you want to specialize in. Uh, to, to kind of wrap it up, um, I love these, I love cartoons, uh, and this is for the fellow mediators in the room. Um, 
I love this one. Here at the end it says, I suppose it's too late to request a mediator, and they're about to charge him off the side of a cliff. Um, um, often in conflict resolution, people wait until the conflict spiral is out of control, and then they react, and it's too late. Yeah, that's when there's war, that's when there's violent conflicts, and our job is to intervene when the conflicts are starting, to go in there, to build peace, to allow for communication, to build dialogue, um, so that it's not too late. So I will go ahead and just end um, that it's a difficult challenge to explain culture because it's dynamic, right? It's constantly changing, it's in flux, um, and it's embedded in every single conflict culture. Uh, and why? Because it involves humans, human contact. So it's important we improve our cultural knowledge. We need to be, be aware of our own false stereotypes. We all have them. We all have our biases. We carry them through us in everything we do, and sometimes we don't even see them. The, pow you know, the power of being a, a, a person working in conflict resolution is you must learn your own biases, and you must look within. What are my triggers that make me get emotional, angry? Uh, and you have to work on yourself as well. Um, we often say the other par party is the problem, and I, it's both sides. Um, so that's why I showed you these maps. In the paper, I offer uh, in the appendix almost like five pages of great websites where you can take personality tests, um, conflict resolution tools, games, things that you can use with your clients to break, break down these communication barriers. Um, and uh, on conclusion, uh, as practitioners, we all work in multiple fields. Um, we need practical tools now to, to be able to intervene in conflicts. And on, at the end, I will leave you with a thought. What, what tools do you need now for yourself in your conflict resolution toolkit? Think about that, and maybe over the next three days, you know, if it's soft power skills or I need to learn hard power, I need to learn how to negotiate and close deals. Um, what are the tools that you feel are missing in your um, expertise? And start working on those. Um, we all have so much to learn. We can never stop learning in conflict resolution. And I encourage you all to take in and learn as much as you can over the next three days. And at the end, to really look at yourself again and say, OK, um, how am I going to change myself so I can change the world? OK, thank you so much.